Hey everybody, this episode of Her Way Her Story was recorded live in front of an audience. But unfortunately, sometimes technology can have a mind of its own, so the audio is a bit inconsistent on this one. But it's still awesome, so have a listen. Um, just first of all, Nina, I guess, you grew up on the northern beaches where I guess a lot of other girls were doing nippers or wanted to be the next Lane Beachley. I think you started sailing racing at age seven. What do you remember about this kind of early days of racing and what did you love about it back then? Thanks, Abby. Um, and thanks for having me as well. I'm really thrilled to be here and I've already learned so much, so thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, I grew up on northern beaches on pit water and it's a pretty idyllic, beautiful place. And um, I guess my memories was uh, sailing such a cool sport, it instills like, quite a lot of independence at a really young age. You're pushed out in a little sailboat and there's no real coaches or people to help you, so you kind of got to figure it out. And I always really enjoyed that about, about sailing, being out there on my own, often with a friend. And I think, you know, that's something that kept me glued to the sport. Um, um, even now um, is that I just really do love sailing. I think it's the best sport ever and I, I still do and I did then. And what was it kind of like as a sport like for a girl back then like was it kind of easy for them to get involved? Yeah it was you know it's it's a funny sport when we talk about you know gender gaps and, and the struggles that we're having trying to get equity within sport you know, you grow up and it's a skill-based sport fundamentally and there's obviously physical limitations, you know, when you get a little bit closer to adulthood. But I went through all the youth events um, without really raising an eyebrow, you know, at the fact that because I really loved it, I stayed there. But, you know, we're racing against boys and, and that kind of, it was all mixed and, and that was quite a natural, organic thing. Um, I stuck with it longer, I think, and you do get that dropout rate of the female athletes. But, uh, you know, I was still doing, they call it youth events, it's quite loosely, we were still 25 years old, but by then I was the last female standing. But I think it actually served me really well because I didn't really notice the difference. I got quite used to the fact that, you know, you can, it doesn't matter if you're male or female or you just got to learn to work with an athlete for, for who they are and what skill set they had. And, um, you know, it wasn't until I was trying to get a paid job in sailing that all of a sudden I was like, why isn't there space for me in this sport anymore? And then there was no future. And it wasn't really until you pop your head out at the other side that you're like, well, actually, this is really unfair, but I hadn't actually had any time to consider it as a younger person. So a pretty cool sport to grow up in, um, in, in that sense, but then quite a rude shock on the other side. Oh, yeah, great answer. Um, and I'm always curious to kind of find out who athletes kind of, I guess, looked up to when they were kids. So who were your role models, I guess? We already mentioned her. I was quite into Lane Beachley, even though I was sailing, that wasn't quite the same. But um, I also really idolised a, a sailor that was also in the, the um, Sydney area, Darren Bundock, and he won a silver medal. And I actually got to go on to sail with him a little bit later in my career. So once I got past all the, the starry-eyedness at, at the time, and he was sailing cool boats, you know, fast catamarans, and that really appealed to me at the time. Um, and he was our representative then. And so yeah, he was a real inspiration. Um, thanks. And I guess we kind of chatted about this before, but I guess as you've kind of gotten older and moved through like the different levels, how have you kind of seen like pathways for girls and women change if they have a lot? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I went um, out of all the youth sailing and like all of my peers who were men tried to you know find a, a job and a spot for myself in sailing I actually did human movement as well <laughs> I studied human movement so I'm pretty old now um, but uh, you know and so at the time, you know, there was no space for me in that workplace to get paid, but where there was equity in, in sport and, and, you know, has been a real trailblazer in that sense is the Olympic Games. And so that's, you know, where I found my space, where I could kind of create a name for myself. And, you know, I joined this huge squad of um, Australian female athletes and we, we went 
towards the London 2012 Olympic Games where um, we managed to win the silver medal, which was pretty fantastic. Um, we, we were all super young um, as a team and quite inexperienced, but we, um, you know, kind of hit the right trajectory at the right time and it all kind of came together for us. After that, um, you know, Olympic campaign, I also had a failed Olympic campaign where I campaigned over two different classes and didn't make it to the Olympics. So I've really seen, you know, both sides of, of that level of, of sport. But, you know, you come out the other side and in the Olympics, you don't actually earn any money. You can pay your way. Sailing's really expensive. So all the money that you do get from sponsorship goes into buying your boats and getting you overseas and traveling. And um, at the time, I was in a mixed discipline class and it was quite groundbreaking. You know, there was a male and a female sailing together um, for that, we were going for that Rio Olympic spot. And, you know, that was like my first kind of encounter of coming back into what was really quite natural for me, like sailing with boys. But I joined Darren Bundock and it was a pretty steep learning curve for him, you know, learning that I was also just another human being. And I also really wanted to win and I wasn't quite, you know, I wasn't half bad at it either. And it's amazing how, you know, after a few months and a little bit of understanding, all of a sudden for these guys, it becomes really natural as well. And I've kind of just gone through my sailing career falling into classes where uh, space is carved out for female athletes in the sport. So my next um, opportunity came over in ocean racing. So I was like, oh, I'll join the ocean racing team, especially if you'll pay me to go sailing, I'm, I'm in. So I joined um, a Dutch team in New Zealand and um, raced with them around the world. So I'd never done much ocean racing at all but um, you know it was a really exciting opportunity but I you know reached that same kind of um, store point with this team where it was the first time that they'd had a female athlete on board their boat and for them a really steep learning curve that again you know we're just all the same we want this just as much and you know after the first few nights we all kind of get used to it and get on with the job and you know we went um and on to have you know a really successful um race we came i think we were coming into the last leg um after you know six months of racing around the world in equal points on first place unfortunately for us we kind of you know took a wrong shift into the finish and, and landed in third place um, and then, you know, what I'm doing right now, which there was some of the footage of um, up on there is the Sail GP, which is, again, another space in sailing where, you know, that opportunity for a female athlete on board the boat was carved out. And I've kind of jumped head first into that. And again, we're coming up with the same challenges and this is getting like a little bit challenging because we're, you know, trying to bridge a skills gap. And um, so that's what's so exciting about this America's Cup campaign is that it's going to be all women. And I think that's really cool. It's a really good opportunity for, you know, for us to not be the minority on board the boat. Um, and it's, it's really awesome sailing with female athletes as well. So, yeah, it's um, a really exciting opportunity. Uh, and it's pretty cool for Australia as well that we've got the entry. Yeah, the I guess it's great just seeing, you know, women being normalised in sailing and just lots of other female sports. Although it would have been great to have it started a long time ago, but I mean, we're getting there. Now we've got <laughs> Women's Only America's Cup. Um, and you mentioned your Olympic silver medal um, in that previous answer, I guess. I think we should touch on your list of achievements, which is pretty amazing. You're an Olympic medalist, the first ever female to win a sailing GP event and season title, third in the Volvo Ocean Race, World Cups, and just so much more. I know this is a pretty tough question, but are you able to pick just one highlight from your career so far? Um, yeah, I, I would probably say it goes back to the, the Olympic silver medal. I think that was um, a really quite hard fought and, and against the odds and something that, you know, we started from the beginning and, and there was, I guess, in that opportunity, no space carved out for us uh, as athletes. That's something that we really had to work really hard for. So that would be my favorite, yeah. yeah. Um, and this might be a bit of a random question, but are there a lot of like, I guess, injuries in sailing? And have you had, I guess, has there been like a worst injury for you so far? Yeah, again, so uh, it's quite an unusual sport. 
um, you know, these boats that we're going to be racing on in the America's Cup, they go 100 kilometres an hour. And that's what I've been racing on for the last two years. I'm actually taking a break. I know I'm very heavily pregnant right now. <laughs> elephant in the room. Um, um, taking a little bit of a break, but it's been an excellent opportunity to get, you know, this cup team set up. Um, in terms of injuries, you know, it can be really catastrophic at that at those speeds, um, especially over the water. And I don't know if you saw, we we're kind of like the boats are flying out of the water, so we're foiling, um, and that's why we're able to go so much faster than the wind. Um, so yeah, I've had some pretty gnarly injuries um, on board the boats, and it's often when you um, make an error. It, it is kind of like flying an, an aircraft or something, and um, a lot of the things that you're doing involve an incredible amount of detail. So if someone you know, makes a really small error, the boat kind of starts to spiral out of control and it usually ends with you kind of ploughing head first uh, into the water and going from 100 to like to nothing in a really short period of time. So you would kind of call it the rag doll or the scorpion. Sometimes scorpions, when you head down and your legs go back over, your body is pretty unpleasant. But we're, um, you know, they're always pushing for safety because we have had some pretty catastrophic you know, we've had deaths on these kind of boats and so forth, and that's definitely a part of the sport. So when we're racing, I'm actually wearing like an impact vest. We're wearing a helmet. Uh, you actually have an oxygen tank um, that comes up here so that if you do get stuck under the boat, you can, you know, directly get in and get air, and that buys you time to get yourself out of trouble. You've got um, two big knives in your life jacket. They're pretty cool as well, so, so you can cut yourself um, out of trouble. Um, um, you know, again, if something goes wrong and everything that we wear has is like, you know, highly um, we're kind of ready for impact in that sense. 100 kilometres an hour, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty you good. mentioned that I guess the boats can, you know, do anything like it can go from being 100 kilometres per hour to zero in probably just like seconds, I imagine. Um, and I guess one of the other things, as part of my research on the America's Cup, I saw a video where Australia's boat literally just sunk like to the bottom of the ocean, like all of, you know, the people on the board just started jumping off, which is shocked me a bit because I hadn't really seen anything like it before. Um, what's been like the weirdest or scariest thing that's happened to you on a boat, although we kind of just talked about injuries, I guess? Um, uh, one of the, I guess we could call it like the scariest moments was when I was doing um, this around the world sailing yacht race. And um, so we sailed from, Auckland in New Zealand and we sailed all the way um, around Cape Horn and then up into Brazil so it took 22 days you know like there's no shower on the boat or beds or you're kind of sleeping in shifts and it gets it's pretty gnarly and uncomfortable but there was a moment where we were sailing through and we we're actually in a snowstorm so it's snowing on our boat and uh, at the same time um, our navigator comes up quite smugly and said all right this is the point we're currently the closest humans to us on the planet are in the space station above us and not nearby on land. So we're a really, really long way from home then. So I think that would be it. <laughs> that is a pretty scary fact. <laughs> um, and I guess just speaking of New Zealand, I was reading an article from New Zealand um, around the 2017 America's Cup. And the article was titled, America's Cup, Where Are All the Women? And it said, the industry says, the Industry says that the boats are just too physical for women, but gold medalist Joel A said that there were simply just no opportunities for women to get experience in the first place. What has your experience been like with the America's Cup in the past? Yeah, such a good question. Great research too. Yeah. I'm very impressed. Yeah. Um, uh, where where we won our silver medal in match racing, it's um, a style of racing where one boat races another. It's match racing, and the America's Cup is the most glory, um, you know, trophy that, and it's in the format of match racing. And so, you know, you had all of these female athletes that had just like spent four years perfecting the art of match racing um, at the Olympic Games at the highest level and thrown everything into it. You come out the other side and they'd pulled match racing from the Olympics, so that didn't exist for us anymore. And we're like, well, we could go into the cup, you know? So you start knocking on doors and, and asking all your contacts and beg, you know, borrow and stealing and really trying to find any kind of opportunity to, to get close to it. I would have just done anything in the, in that moment, especially after those Olympic Games, to um, even just get close. 
um, to the America's Cup. My little brother is also a great sailor and he's made a career out of working. He makes ropes. I know it's a really obscure job, but um, he's worked for America's Cup teams his entire career making ropes. And, um, you know, it was just impossible for me to get near um, the America's Cup then, even after I'd just done, you know, a four-year degree in, in, um, in match racing, specifically what these guys were doing. And the answer for me in those instances when I when an opportunity was closed was that there's no space for someone of your size on this boat and so I'm not normally as heavy as I am right now <laughs> um, but as a 60 something kilo athlete there is no space for you on the boat at that time which I think is absolute rubbish because you look around in sailing boats and often there's a guy steering and there's nothing physical about that it is a skills gap and the skills gap exists because this door has been shut to us and therefore, you know, um, the younger athletes, it's not visible to you, so you're not pouring your time and energy into bridging that skills gap. And that's where we're at right now, which is really exciting because we're visible and um, there are athletes doing really cool things at high speeds. And, you know, I go to yacht clubs whenever I get the chance and there are girls there with stars in their eyes and they're just chasing this like nothing else. And if they take those pathways, then at these levels of opportunity, there'll be no excuse because there is no skills gap. But that's, you know, what we were up against at that time. And um, that's gonna be the key to finding equity in a sport that absolutely should be equal. And I was having a look at some videos on YouTube this week about what a big event the America's Cup was back in the 1980s especially, because obviously I wasn't alive then. <laughs> and like all of Australia basically watched it, I saw like I saw this interview where this guy would go up to random people on the street and just ask about how significant it was and everyone would just be like, oh yeah, it's amazing, you know, I was watching it, it was just incredible. And even Prime Ministers and US Presidents were involved. For other female sailors that you have chatted to, what does it mean to have the chance to just be a part of this history, I guess, just speaking on behalf of everyone? Yeah, we're so grateful. John Bertrand has actually just joined our team as a patron and um, he was the skipper um, for that huge America's Cup win when the Prime Minister announced that anyone that sacks a colleague that doesn't show up to work today is a bum. So that was you know, quite an iconic moment in Australian history. And, um, you know, so the skippers joined our team in full support of um, getting this Australian team over the line. And we do have um, the support of so many of these guys from that generation. And yeah, it's just iconic. It, it's really in the roots of um, of Australians in the, that, that they are in the sport. And I think, you know, if you're a little bit older, you can still remember that buzz that existed then. But what you don't see right now is that um, we, we've got actually male um, Australian sailors in every one of the international America's Cup teams. We don't actually have an Australian team. And so it, it's actually going to work really well in our favour because we've got access, access to these incredible humans that are working for all of these very highly funded teams. Um, and they're all our mates and they all really want um, this, to see the Australian flag back in the sport and we've actually done the, done the work to get us there so we're in a unique opportunity in that sense that we have been able to really um, make the most of that opportunity and that really rich success from, from back in the day. Um, and I guess obviously USA dominated the Men's America's Cup for about the first 130 years unfortunately. <laughs> Do you think that the women's Australian team can really just create their own domination now, I guess, with this huge chance. Yeah, I really do. We've um, got some incredible uh, female talent in our sport um, and spread across all sorts of different opportunities as well. So it's a really exciting time for us. We've just opened our applications and they're all in here. Um, the caliber over all sorts of different sports is, I think it's going to be one of our biggest challenges is selecting, um, you know, that team because we do just have um, some pretty amazing talent. So there's no doubt in my mind that we can win this. We're not doing it to come second. <laughs> We're, um, you know, very, very loudly confident that we, you know, we can win the America's Cup. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, I guess, I'll be able to watch it this time. <laughs> um, and I guess just apart from that, what excites you the most for this America's Cup journey and just what its legacy could be? Yeah, 
it is actually the legacy that excites me the most. I'm um, 35 and I'll be a mum when um, when we do get to the start line for the America's Cup. So um, that's a really proud point for me, you know, that it's important for it to be visible that you can, you know, be an athlete and return to the sport um, if you so wish. So that's going to be a really huge opportunity. And, you know, I'm so excited for Australia to be able to really fly that flag and, and get out on the water and do that. It's been, you know, such a long time coming. So, yeah, it's going to be really brilliant. Um, and I've just got one final question. How can Australians just support you and your team? Look, we really need sponsorship and I'm so inspired by everything that's gone on. Um, we've been taking avid notes and we are um, we are in the money for some sponsorship and that's really what's going to dictate to us the scope of our campaign, how many female athletes we can fall into and, and then select from from there, how many coaches we can get access to, how many simulator hours we can get how many hours we can hire the boats for and it really is going to come down to um, the dollar amount that we can get together so we've got a fantastic team but if you know anyone that wants to sponsor the first ever Australian America's Cup winning team um, talk to the Brains Trust over here. <laughs> um, well thanks so much for coming and chatting Nina. Good luck to you and the entire team and I can't wait to see it all come to life I guess. Thanks for listening. To support Huawei, visit the link in the description section.